Welcome back to another edition of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum podcast. Master bladesmith Mike Williams from southeastern Oklahoma was a presenter at the museum's annual Chuck Wagon Festival. Join us now as Don Reeves discusses the fine art of hand forged knife making with Mike Williams, an instructor with the American Bladesmith Society. Well, welcome back to another podcast of the National Cowboy Museum. It's been a couple weeks now since we've uh, been together, but uh, it's delighted to be here today at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum's Cowboy Chuck Wagon Gathering. And here today with uh, Mike Williams from Southeastern Oklahoma. And in conjunction with the exhibit we've got right now at the museum, it's called The Bowie Knife, Icon of American uh, Culture. And uh, Mike is a, a bladesmith with American yes. Blade, uh, Bladesmith Society, Very um, considered a master smith. Yes, I am a master smith. And welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. I build uh, knives. I build custom knives of different types, but one of my specialties is uh, elaborate traditional bowie knives, and it's something that I've worked uh, a lot of years on, uh, about 20 years into business, and uh, I think it will uh, it will add to the exhibit. I really do. It is great to bring the element of hand forged knives to the people that are going to be here at this festival and yeah. to the exhibit. What's the difference between a hand hand forged knife and something that's made out of uh, bar stock? You know. Well, a traditionally forged blade is I can take a standard piece of bar stock of any kind and forge any type of point on it that I prefer a drop point, a spear point, uh, almost anything is within a realm of what I want to build with a hammer. Stock removal limits you to the size of stock you have in hand. If you only have an inch and a half stock you can only make an inch and a half knife. By forging I can make it smaller or larger at will. Well, we're not in a knife society anymore, but we, we talked briefly uh, you know, earlier in the day about uh, the time of the Bowie knife. Was, was, it was knife society, it and, was. And, and a personal knife was a, a very important and precious thing. It was, it was your ultimate defense weapon. Uh, in the days of single shot, revol uh, single shot percussion pistols and single shot rifles, if your gun didn't fire, you didn't have a weapon. You, almost everyone carried a knife. Um, they used it for everything. You couldn't afford multiple knives. You had one knife and used it for everything that it could be used for. It was uh, a using tool, but it's also a defensive weapon. And it was uh, designed as such. The Bowie knife was predominantly uh, the first truly American designed knife. It was uh, not a throwback from Europe. It was something designed in America. It is what we call the prototypical American knife. Well, one of the things, the Bowie knife is steeped in legend now. It was True. really steeped in legend by 1835. True. You know, uh, hearsay. I heard about this knife fight. I, da, 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 I heard about this shit. In your definition, I've heard many definitions of what is a Bowie knife. For you as a master bladesmith, uh, what, what uh, makes a Bowie knife? A Bowie knife is, is an offensive weapon. That, it was made to stick people. As <laughs> bad as that sounds, your gun didn't fire, his gun didn't fire, Nobody's gun fired, you had to have a weapon. Uh, I've handled several original buoys from uh, the, the John Black Forge. Uh, they were, some of them very, very plain, but there's a couple of them that are very, very elaborate. They weren't, weren't just butcher knives, as some people would have you believe. Uh, the Searles buoy that's on display at the Alamo is a very, very elaborate knife. It was not made by a backcountry smith. It was made by a very accomplished smith and silversmith to build that knife. Great. Well, in that regard, you've got, as a master bladesmith, you've gone for building functional knives, with large blades, small blades, uh, to making works of art right. with, with the Damascus process, which is hard for us to understand now. How does that, how, what's different about that? What, what's, well, what, why, why do that? The, the Damascus process is, is the old method of manipulating your steel to arrange the carbon content which allows you to make the blade hard. The original steels were very soft, they wouldn't hold an edge. So they folded the layers to manipulate the carbon content to make the blade hard. But now we have high carbon steel, we can buy it, but now we manipulate the steel to make it beautiful. Uh, we can make a, a really functional knife out of a piece of plain steel, 
we can make a truly beautiful knife just like it out of Damascus with precious materials on it. You brought a, a beautiful one. Uh, I think it's called Hard Country. Yes. Is, is that it? And, and it's not only just, we're used to seeing some of the Damascus steel blades now, which show the folding kind of uh, uh, layers, but this one is swirling. It's very, very artful. It's, What's the difference in that? Uh, it's just a manipulation of patterns um, to make it pleasing to the eye. Uh, folds and Damascus are, are beautiful when you first see it, but after uh, a few hundred knives it becomes commonplace. And we try to do something new and unique so that you, you look at the blade and one, that it's beautiful, two, that it's functional, but also how did he do that? And that's one of the things in, in my business, uh, we have to stay ahead of the competition. Uh, as a, a full-time knife maker, and this is the way I make my living, if I don't do something new and unique, uh, pretty regular, then my work becomes what he used to do. And so we have to stay on top of the game. We have to make things that are neat, that, that catches a collector's eye, uh, and he says, wow, I just, I just can't quite figure out how you made that work. And we call it juice. We get juice. Uh, the other makers look at it, uh, it's not hard to impress the collectors. It's hard to impress the other makers. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, the, the other makers, the other craftsmen, the right. other master craftsmen. Right. The other that's master. who pushes you. That's who, who yes. pushes each other to higher levels. Yes. yes. We're uh, good friends, but we're also competitors. He will tell me what he does. And if I can't do it as well as he does, it, so what? But if I do it better, then he has to step up his game. And so then the next thing I show him something that I'm doing, then he does it better than me. Now I have to step up my game. And in doing so, uh, there's a, a group of us makers that are very close to each other, but we're always pushing each other. Uh, there are only 118 master smiths in the world today. Remarkable, uh, remarkable. And most of us know each other pretty well. And there's always somebody with a new gimmick. Mm. And so the rest of us are playing catch up and then we just keep pushing the ball up. Ra raising the bar. That's the it. Bar. It's hard for a craftsman to say their favorite, but one of their projects that they're most proud of. Um, can you think of one of those? And, and that's taking it from functional to, 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 to would you say, art? To yeah, fine it, art? It, 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 it passed a utilitarian knife. Basically, you can go to the hardware and buy a very good utilitarian knife. But we want to, to push it to a level. It's, it's no different than a... Uh, a handmade hat, a handmade pair of spurs, a handmade pair of boots. You, you, you want to bring it to the next level. And uh, right now a project I'm working on is what I call my living history series. And I'm using artifacts from the family farm or something like this and actually forging into them a very beautiful but usable knife. And it's something that you can uh, hold on to in, in, in your family and pass it down, not just as a knife, but it's a, it's a part of my history, a part of my traditions. And it may be only be a, a plow point or a, a hay rake spring, uh, part of an old John Deere tractor, it doesn't matter, but it's something that you can hold on from your old history that, that you can pass down and say, this was made not only from this, but by this craftsman. And it, it takes it to a new level. Well, you brought with you today a, a knife that, that you were explaining that the, the fellow has from their family had a, a file but some barbed wire. Right. And, and, right. and this, what is it, a little over three inch blade or whatever? Yeah, it's but about three and a half. Yes. That, yeah, that, how could you make a knife from barbed wire? Well, the, 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 the client from Pennsylvania that commissioned this wanted the, the wire from, from his grandpa's old farm and he's got a piece of the walnut tree that they, him and his brother used to play on when they were small children. And the barbed wire will not harden. It, it, it doesn't have enough carbon there. But he sent me an old file or two that he dug up and I sandwiched the barbed wire on each side of the old file and the file will get real hard. It will get plenty hard for a knife blade. And now he's got the look of the barbed wire but the cutting edge of a high carbon file. And it's gonna look great. He's gonna be tickled to death. And it's something that, that he can pass down. This is not just a knife, but it's real. And, and that's something we, we, we really want to try to, it's got to be more than a knife. One of the things we, we want to talk about is 
why we're forging, but also the temperature. As you can see, this steel is bright red right now. It doesn't look bright, but this is a magnet. The steel will not stick to that magnet once it gets above 1500 degrees. See, it sticks good there. We pull it back. That will not stick to that magnet because it's too hot. So we're above 1500 degrees. Out in the bright sun, we have to be very careful that we're not forging too hot because we can burn the steel by getting it too hot. So I keep the magnet at, at demos out in the sun so I can tell how hot I'm running. Most blacksmith shops are always dark because that allows you to see the colors of the steel very easily. In the dark room, you'd see that was bright yellow, and which is it's, it's awful hot. As we get it darker, you can see it's much brighter in the dark here than it is out in the sun. It's glowing a good dull red now. So we just lay it on the anvil and start pulling down our edge. This is called our cutting edge. It looks like we're forging black, but we're not. You can see the edge is pulling down. We're starting to get a belly of the blade. The clip is starting to be shaped in. And back in the forge. We can't hit it cold. If you hit it cold, you'll crack your steel. So we have to always be careful that we're forging it hot enough, but not too hot. And never hit it cold. If you hit it cold, it'll crack. Okay, one of the one of the things that is unique amongst blacksmiths and bladesmiths is the shape of their hammers. Everybody prefers a different different hammer head shape, heel shape, and also this part of the hammer is very important. This hammer is thin to fit my grip, very thin here, so I get spring back from the anvil. But this part of the hammer allows my hand to index the face of the hammer on the anvil. It's very important that you manipulate this head to move the metal in the direction you want. We don't just hit down. We hit at very specific but slight angles to move the metal. Having the handle like this allows my hand to talk to my brain without having to keep an eye on the face of the hammer. And I can forge it very, very effectively that way. Uh, if you forge for a long time, you'll find that your handle will pretty much wear in to fit your hand, but once you get it fitted, it's very important that you got to use your hammer. Well, thank you, Mike. I'll tell you what, this has been another great podcast with the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. We'll see you again in about a month. This podcast is a companion to our quarterly publication, Persimmon Hill Magazine. It's a great resource for keeping you in touch with our great Western heritage and is available by subscription. Visit nationalcowboymuseum.org for details. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.